Hey everyone, and welcome to my second video analyzing the techniques I've learned while studying the writing style of Patrick Rothfuss, all excerpts taken from his novel, The Name of the Wind. In this video, I'll be honing in on three very important conjunctions, namely the words and, but, and then. Seeing as conjunctions are the words that connect clauses or sentences and coordinate words within a given clause, conjunctions often lay the groundwork for the variety of sentence structures we use when writing narrative prose. Note that while the word then is not technically a conjunction in the English language, seeing as the proper usage is and then, where and is the conjunction, you will nevertheless find the word then used as a conjunction in narrative prose. The and is simply implied, and thus it is omitted. A quick Google search will give you a comprehensive list of all the conjunctions in the English language, and I would highly recommend reading through them, as these are the little words that bridge the gaps between the more significant words, and learning their appropriate usage is of utmost importance. Not only will expert use of conjunctions ensure your writing makes sense, it will also diversify your sentence structures, thus enhancing the rhythm of your prose. But as I said, in this video we'll be focusing on the big three, and, but, and then, as these tend to make up the backbone of most sentence structures. The conjunctions so and as also pop up a lot in Rothfuss's prose, but I didn't want to get too carried away. Because not only did I want to examine his use of the words and, but, and then, I wanted to look at three unique instances of each, those instances being capital and, comma and, lowercase and, as well as the capital, comma, and lowercase version of but, and the capital and comma version of then. Note that I removed the lowercase version of then, because it rarely comes up, if ever. Understanding the usage of these eight structures is a critical factor in determining how you break up your narration into individual sentences, and thus plays a major role in shaping your overall writing style. So without further ado, let's begin with the mightiest of all conjunctions, and. For each of the three unique instances I mentioned earlier, I've gathered excerpts from Patrick Rothfuss's novel The Name of the Wind, so I might discuss the primary ways in which this conjunction is used. Note that there is nothing particularly special about these excerpts. These are not the elegant, poetic, or thought-provoking sentences that one might use to capture the essence of a writer's style. Rather, these are the mundane sentences that make up the majority of any novel. Necessary and useful, but on their own, not particularly special. Let us begin with capital AND, which refers to when AND is used to begin a sentence. There are two primary ways Rothfuss uses this version of the conjunction. See if you can notice the difference. After setting up the fume hood, I made my way to the table where the bone tar was kept. Despite the fact that I knew it was no more dangerous than a stone saw or the sintering wheel, I found the burnished metal container unnerving. And today, something was different. Still, Ambrose continued to seek me out, like a dog too stupid to avoid a porcupine. He would snap at me and leave with a face full of barbs, and each time we parted ways, we hated each other just a little more. In the first example, capital AND is used as a transition, shifting the focus of the narrative away from the physical dangers of the setting, such as bone tar, stone saws, and sintering wheels, to something less tangible, more like a feeling. But note how this is not a transition via contrast, as we'll see later with the conjunction but. When AND is used, the transition is building upon, not contradicting, the preceding information. Here, the AND conjunction adds to the unnerving feeling that has already been described, and does not negate it. Moving on to the second example, instead of a transition, we see an example where capital AND is used as a continuation. That is to say, it continues the narrative along the same line of thought. One could argue that a comma could be used here instead of a period, but personally, I like this sentence break, seeing as each of these two sentences, while being related, has a different focus. The first describes their typical encounter, while the second describes the aftermath of said encounter. These are two distinct pieces of information, and thus a comma would make the sentence feel a touch bloated. Not wrong, just less concise. But at the same time, you need to include the AND conjunction to bridge the gap. Without it, the flow of the sentences would be clunky, and so a capital AND is used. Following the capital AND, let's take a look at the comma AND excerpts. Again, we have two unique usages. Finishing the emitters took hours longer than I'd expected. My injuries distracted me, and my bandaged thumb made my hand slightly clumsy. Kilvin shook it once, sharply, and my hand lamp tumbled free, rolling awkwardly across the table. In the first example, the comma and is used to list two distinct, albeit related, facts. His injuries are distracting, and his bandaged thumb made his hand clumsy. Since both clauses relate to the same topic, namely the consequences of his injuries, a comma is used instead of a period. In the second example, the comma and is used to progress a sequence of events, indicating that a span of time has elapsed. Kilvin shook it, and the hand lamp tumbled free. Since these two clauses are related via action and consequence, a comma is used instead of a period. The last unique instance of the AND conjunction is the lowercase AND, meaning an AND that has no punctuation nearby. 
What you're essentially doing with this one is packaging two bits of information as one, either because they are very closely related or because they are happening back to back and you don't want to slow down the pace with a comma. Take the following, for example. When he saw me approaching, he waved me over and wandered back to his usual perch at the bar, clapping me affectionately on the shoulder as he walked by. In this instance, both him waving me over and wandering back to his usual perch at the bar are things he did when he saw me approaching. Because they are both a part of the same reaction, no comma is used. Same goes for the following. I nodded and smiled, or I shouted and waved to get her attention. Here, nodding and smiling are both part of the same expression, just as shouting and waving are both done to get her attention. As mentioned earlier, you can also use the lowercase and to describe actions happening in quick succession, where slowing down the pace would break your flow. Take the following, for example. I brought her hand to my lips and kissed it. Bella bought me a drink and we chatted for a while about small things. In both these examples, you could technically use a comma as these events happen in sequence, but notice how the pace would slow down if you did. Because neither Fella buying him a drink nor them chatting for a while are terribly important, Rothfuss determined that they did not need their own separate clauses, so he did not bother slowing down the pace with a comma. Now, let's move on to the then conjunction. It's the least common of the three, but in some ways it is similar to and, so I think it's best if I discuss them in sequence. The main question you should be asking yourself is, what's the difference between and and then? As I mentioned previously, then is not technically a conjunction at all. Rather, the textbook usage is to write and then. But when writing narrative prose, we're allowed to break a few rules, often leaving out words that are implied or excessive. Essentially, when writing a novel, you use then whenever you need to make a leap forward in time. Specifically, when you're leaping forward to some sort of action that occurs after the previous one, but is not directly related, or rather, it is related, but only insofar as that it happens in the same chronological sequence of events. You may also use then if you're looking to avoid the repetition of the and conjunction, or, more likely, because you want to smooth over a transition or sentence break that would otherwise sound a touch jarring. When it comes to capital then, the latter is most often the reason, so let's take a look at how then is used for transitions. I drew a deep breath and looked out over the town I had saved. Then I heard a grating noise and felt the roof shift beneath me. One moment all is well, and the next everything is going to hell. Notice how if you were to remove the then conjunction, the transition would be a tad jarring. In this case, the word then essentially works to smooth things over. The same goes for this next example. It breathed another gout of blue fire in a high arc, the same gesture it had made before, a greeting or a challenge. Then it was running, tearing down the hillside with demented abandon. Just as the capital and conjunction can be used for both transitions and continuations, so too can capital then. The following two examples show capital then used as a continuation. I slung my travel sack over my shoulder and cinched it tight across my back. Then I thumbed on my sympathy lamp, picked up the hatchet, and began to run. I slowed to a trot as I came into town, catching my breath. Then I scampered up the side of a house to one of the few two-story rooftops so I could see what was really happening. In both of these examples, Rothfuss would not have been wrong, per se, to do without the capital then. But the more I've read his work, the more I find myself appreciating these sorts of conjunctions, as they smooth over otherwise jagged sentence breaks and maintain the flow of the narrative. It's also important to distinguish between and and then. The best way I can describe this is to say that and links two pieces of information that are directly related, while then is like a leap forward in time, linking two pieces of information, often actions, that occur sequentially but are not necessarily related to one another. Now, it should also be noted that this conjunction should be used rather sparingly, or at the very least not frequently. In the past, I myself never used capital then much at all, if ever, but after reading Rothfuss's writing, he's convinced me that they have their time and place. Moving on to the comma then conjunction, we have the following examples. She reached out halfway to me with one hand, then hesitated and let it fall back to her side. Ari jumped up and ran back to where the apple tree overhung the edge of the roof, then scampered back toward us, her hair flying behind her like a flag. As I mentioned previously, the conjunction then is a leap forward in time, often linking two sequential actions that are only related by the fact that they occur one after the other. But the comma then conjunction has a secondary function as well, often acting as a contradiction, though not as strong a contradiction as the conjunction but. As you can see here, the word then could be replaced by the phrase only to, while still maintaining the logic of the sentence, as in, she reached out halfway to me with one hand, only to hesitate and let it fall back to her side. Ari jumped up and ran to where the apple tree overhung the edge of the roof, only to scamper back toward us, her hair flying behind her like a flag. Notice the contradiction. As I mentioned earlier on, I did not include the lowercase then conjunction in this video, as it is rarely used, if ever. So let's move on to the final conjunction in the trinity. But. 
Fundamentally, the but conjunction implies that whatever information comes after is going to contrast or contradict the information that came before. When it comes to the capital but conjunction, there are two main usages. You can use it as a transition in a similar manner as and and then, or you can use it in the typical way to contrast what has just been said. Let's take a look at a couple excerpts that use capital but as a transition. The flames had dimmed, and in most places had subsided to sullen coals. I hadn't doused the fires, merely slowed them down enough to give the townsfolk and their buckets a fighting chance. But my job was only half done. Cold unlike anything I'd ever felt stabbed into me. Not the simple cold you feel in your skin and limbs on a winter day. It hit my body like a clap of thunder. I felt it in my tongue and lungs and liver. But I got what I wanted. Seeing as we've discussed transitions twice already, I won't delve too deeply into what's going on here, but I think it's fairly obvious. You have a description of information or events, followed by a statement that changes the direction of the narrative. Here, it seems like it's only a matter of time before the fire is extinguished. But, as it turns out, his job is only half done. Similarly, here we have a description of some very unpleasant symptoms of hypothermia, or binders chills to those who are familiar with the series, followed by a statement that takes the logical form, this was terrible, but I got what I wanted. The second type of instance where Rothfuss uses the capital but conjunction is quite similar, only the transition is less abrupt, continuing the same sequence of events instead of changing directions entirely. In this sense, but acts more as a continuation than a transition. You'll also notice with the following examples how Rothfuss does not start a new paragraph with the capital but, as he did in the previous ones. There were people everywhere. Some were simply standing, confused. Others panicked and ran to the church, hoping to find shelter in the tall stone building or the huge iron wheel that hung there, promising them safety from demons. But the church doors were locked, and they were forced to find shelter elsewhere. I glanced at the scattered projects on the nearby work table, looking for anything that could be of some help. But there was nothing. A jumble of basalt blocks, spools of copper wire, a half-inscribed hemisphere of glass that was probably destined to become one of Kilvin's lamps. And as easy as that, I knew what I had to do. Notice here how well but is used to turn the tides on these poor townsfolk, describing how they are trying to hide in the church, only to find the doors are locked. The writing does not stray in its focus. Instead of changing directions, it continues to describe the actions of the townsfolk, saying they were forced to find shelter elsewhere. Similarly, while this example throws the character for a bit of a loop, contrasting his expectations to find a useful item by saying, but there was nothing, the paragraph maintains its focus, going on to describe what items were available. This example is also a bit of a hybrid, as it contains a capital and transition as well. The comma but conjunction is very similar, used to describe two pieces of information that contrast one another. The difference is that for a comma to be used, these two pieces of information must be directly related. Take the following, for example. I felt a brief, intense flash of heat on my hands and face, but my wet clothes kept me from being burned or catching fire. Some people watched, horrified and weeping from their windows, but a surprising number kept their heads and were forming a bucket line from the town's cistern atop the city hall to a nearby burning building. Again, these sentence structures take the logical form, even though I felt a brief, intense flash of heat on my hands and face, my wet clothing kept me safe. Or, even though some people were horrified and weeping, a surprising number kept their heads. This is a great way of describing two contrary facts, actions, emotions, perceptions, ideas, etc. that are directly related, which is what makes the comma but conjunction an essential technique in the toolbox of every writer. Last and likely least, we have the lowercase but conjunction, which is essentially the same as the comma but, except, as is with the lowercase and, the pace is sped up and the pieces of information on either side of the conjunction are more closely linked. Growing increasingly frustrated, I grabbed the grate and tugged on it hard, again and again. It made several echoing metallic thumps, but didn't come free. As you can see, the lowercase but contrasts his efforts to open the grate, specifically the metallic thumps it makes, with the outcome, namely, that it did not come free. It would not be at all wrong to put a comma here, but Rothfuss simply wanted to keep up the pace. These are the little decisions that you, as a writer, must make. Anyway, I hope you found my analysis of the and, but, and then conjunctions useful. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and as always, remember to like and subscribe for more technical writing videos.